All right, welcome everybody. The name of that song was Better Than We Found It. And with that in mind, I'm so happy to have as our inaugural speaker for the NIPAN speaker series, Warren Mosler, who I'm convinced that after this presentation, you're gonna realize that we can make America a better place for all of us. Um, basic rules are gonna be, um, the first half of this presentation is just gonna be questions and answers uh, that I'm gonna be asking uh, Warren. Um, but in the meantime, if anything sparks your, your uh, creative juices, put your questions in the chat. Um, and I may break from protocol from time to time to take a question from there. But the whole second half of this program is geared towards this audience that's here. So you're gonna be able to ask questions directly to uh, Mr. Mosler. So I'm gonna just start off by asking um, Mr. Mohler, Mosler, to look at America today uh, through an economic lens, uh, to tell us what you think about what's going on today. And we're gonna just segue into what MNT is uh, after that. Uh, thank you for uh, coming and joining us, joining us here. Okay, so uh, currently we have um, a lot of people out of work. We're probably down 15 million people from where we might otherwise be and all real output comes from doing work. And so we're, uh, the lost output during the last year, the lost real output during the last year is probably something in the order of magnitude of all the real losses of all the wars in history. So we're like, uh, we're bleeding right now in, in that sense uh, and not anywhere near meeting our potential as, as a society. Okay, and another thing happened in the last year and that is um, immediately after COVID, uh, what I would call the environmental degradation, pollution levels, uh, et cetera, they dropped something like 50% immediately and all on non-essentials. Okay, so we gave up non-essentials in our emissions, harmful emissions, problematic emissions dropped 50%. Now that's more than we could have dropped by you know, all the Green New Deals anyone ever dreamed up for the next 50 years and all the trillions of dollars it's supposed to have cost. And it just happened, okay, through conservation. Now, I've been talking about conservation uh, before that, saying we could cut our emissions in half, but I had no idea it was actually gonna happen. And so, and it was done by eliminating non-essentials. So if these things are non-essential, and now we're bringing them all back, uh, and we're back to about 90% of where we were before in terms of environmental degradation, the rate of de degrading the environment. Uh, you know, what's going on here? It's, you talk about squandering an opportunity. Okay, we brought back non-essentials to reverse all the progress we made. And, and now to make that progress again without a COVID shock is, is just going to be like a enormously costly you know, in real terms. And that's just... Uh, so disappointing to see that opportunity slip off. So anyway, I had to sneak that in. Yeah. Warren, um, I'm already going to take a question from the chat here. Yeah. Michael Graves is saying, what do you mean by non-essentials? Yeah, well, there was uh, plenty of food. Uh, there, was no, there were no shortages of anything except uh, handy wipes or something like that on a temporary basis. And uh, none of the, um, oh, oh, you know, in that sense, it was considered a drop in non-essentials. Any essential services were kept going, essential to sustain life, it's essential to move on. Now, I know there's like uh, disagreements over what's essential and what's not, but the things that we stopped doing, um, I'm saying can be brought back. Right? We, we could have made an effort to bring them back or to bring things back. We didn't have to bring back the exact same things. We bring everything back in a way that didn't contribute to environmental degradation from where we were. Yeah. So I know in my, own, I, yeah. in my own world, I'm a school teacher. Yeah. Last March, you know, we got the order that we're going to be doing all our education from the home. Yeah. And just logically there, in terms of the traffic that normally would appear on the Long Island Expressway, yes. teachers going to and fro work, yes. that all disappeared. That was gone. Yes. Yeah. And, and I did notice that, you know, it just seemed for that window of time, the... Yeah how wonderful life was, you know, in terms of the environment. Right, right. So you're suggesting right. that maybe that's a lost opportunity or something we could be thinking about in terms of maybe re rethinking the world of work? 
Yeah, you know, and um, miles driven dropped by, I don't know, 30 or 40 percent initially, maybe more. And now we're the idea is, OK, we need the economy is doing better now. People are driving. It's back to 90 percent. Good job, America. You know, and we're, we're back to number one in the world with miles driven or something. And all our, all our yardsticks are just had a chip. We have a chance to start remeasuring how well we're doing. We could have been downloading more software, doing something that doesn't degrade the environment or having more live performances in neighborhoods where we didn't have to drive to or um, I, I don't know. You know, it's just there wasn't any effort at all made to recognize what had happened, any effort to continue doing it to people a lot smarter than I am who, can, who could have come up with ways to bring back what's important to our lives that you know, we could accomplish without um, degrading the environment. And we have so many, uh, so much of our output now has a zero marginal cost, all, all, all the things we downloaded and uh, zero uh, environmental impact. And these are the areas that we can grow on, grow in indefinitely. It's not the end of growth, it's the end of destructive growth that we have to look at. And it, it wasn't even considered at all. All the metrics that we're judging by are the same ones that got us to where we were to begin with. So anyway, we're a little away from MMT, but That's okay. I'll, keep, I'll, I'll keep coming back. We, we, we are going to come back to that. Um, yeah. Let's just start off with the basics of what is MMT? Yes. Uh, and how did you come to MMT yourself? Okay. So I, you know, I've been... Um, I used to be a fund manager. I, from 1982 to 1997, I ran an investment company. We had the number one risk adjusted returns in the world. We didn't have a losing trade for all 15 years. It was all fixed income, uh, interest rate type of things. Uh, derivatives, I was the guy who invented a lot of those derivatives of the 1980s working with dealers like Solomon Brothers and Goldman Sachs. I, was, uh, I started off on the uh, trading desk sales desk at the Bankers Trust. Uh, we were a primary dealer at the time. So that's that's where I got my uh, and my say, education. Derivatives yeah. aren't necessarily a good thing. Uh, having just yeah. shown my students the movie The Big Short. Yeah. And all the crazy well, look, that was going on. Yeah. But if you go to buy a house, you know, to buy corn futures because you have a food company and you need to uh, lock in the price of your corn for the next couple of years, that's not a bad thing. That's a derivative. So uh, anything that represents something else is a derivative. But uh, we used to, um, you know, embed derivatives into uh, agency paper. So you'd have a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mae security, and we put in all kinds of uh, uh, performance uh, uh, clauses in those to to tailor what people wanted to fit their investment portfolios. Which is, a, you know, it's a complete waste of human endeavor. The whole thing. But but being in the middle of that made it very obvious to me that the entire, pretty much the entire financial sector, apart from maybe a payment system, is a, is a complete waste of human endeavor and it's entirely parasitic. So what puts you away from that and to, to this world of MMT? Yeah, so uh, in 1992, um, there was a situation in Italy where Italian bonds were uh, very uh, inexpensive because everybody thought that government would default. And if you could come up with a reason they wouldn't default, then there was a lot of opportunity there to make returns for your investors. And that's when I came up with the what I'm going to tell you next about MMT. And so I wouldn't have thought about it if it wasn't for that situation. It just was a situation that directed my thought in that direction. Once I understood it, and then I saw what was going on with the political debates in the US, I became um, uh, you know, committed to getting that knowledge out there with the understanding that it's a very simple piece of knowledge can make an enormous difference. And it's been 30 years. And, the, and so there's two possibilities. It's a lot more difficult to get this knowledge into the world and have it what, and what uh, is serve it? public purpose. What, me? Is, what is that knowledge? What did you learn? Okay, so the, the knowledge is that every congressman, every member of parliament uh, thinks that they need to get money by taxing to be able to spend. I have to, I gotta get the money if I wanna spend. So I tax it to spend. And when I don't tax, if I, if I want to spend more than what I get in tax, I have to go borrow it somewhere to be able to spend it. So President Obama took a trip to China with I don't know, Hillary Clinton and somebody else to talk to our bankers to make sure that we could borrow the money for health care. 
so it was clearly the mindset that there was this imperative to get the money in to be able to spend it. And when I first started, it was Ross Perot who was coming on about the deficit and the debt and how we were going bankrupt and the children, the next generation. Uh, so it, um, so anyway, so that's what every member of Congress believed. And it turned out that it's completely backwards that the money, the dollars to pay taxes, the dollars to buy government bonds, they all come from the government and its agents. Today, the Federal Reserve is an agent of the government. It's just, it uses the Federal Reserve as its uh, public bank to, to uh, process all its transactions. But it's, it's an agent of the government and it operates as under the Federal Reserve Act of Congress to, to uh, do Congress's congressional will. Anyway, so the, the fact is that all the dollars to pay taxes, all the dollars to buy bonds come from the Federal Reserve. They come from the U.S. government, which means the U.S. government is actually spending first crediting accounts. And then those are the dollars that can then be used to pay taxes or um, can then be used to buy government bonds. Okay, so it's the economy that needs the government's money to pay its taxes and to buy government bonds. It's not that the government needs our money to spend. Okay, they've got it completely backwards. I call it sequence. So the most important takeaway you can get from MMT is sequence. And everyone, I, you know, I'd go regularly visit people at the Fed and discuss monetary policy. And they all know this. All the uh, senior staff, they say it another way. They say, you can't do a reserve drain without a prior reserve ad. That means they have to, to you know, reserve ad means they buy something, they buy securities, and pay for them, which adds dollars to the banking system. Then the banking system has the money to buy government bonds or to pay taxes. And money and dollars can be transferred to the treasury. But you can't transfer dollars out of an account that's empty. So the Fed's job is what's called offsetting operating factors, where they make sure they're spending first so the dollars are there to be paid to the government. And spending can take the form of lending. Lending is actually a subset of spending. You're just buying the other person's promissory note. So without getting too technical, it's all the same thing. It's all crediting accounts at the uh, member bank accounts at the Fed. Okay, so that was 1992, that important takeaway. So now, once you see the government spends first and then the dollars are there to pay taxes, the whole imperative changes. Okay, there's no, how can you be like, crowding anybody out or how can borrowing be using up dollars that could be doing something else? They're the dollars you just spent. Uh, and then these people voluntarily use those dollars you just added to buy government bonds. Uh, and if you're spending first, how can you like, how can there be a solvency problem? They say, you know, the question of where's the money coming from? It's not applicable. You're just crediting accounts and you have to credit them first before you can debit them. It's a simple fact of accounting. Uh, even if you allow banks to run uh, clients to run overdrafts. An overdraft is a loan from the bank. An overdraft, so you're lending first, either directly, proactively, or through an overdraft. It's all the same thing for accounting purposes. Okay, so once you understand that, uh, the entire solvency issue goes away. You're no longer worried about the government bossing checks. But what if China doesn't buy our debt? That, that, that's like, well, what if we spend money and we credit their account, and then they just leave it in that account and don't move it to another account called the debt, treasury securities, they're just a savings account. Uh, nothing happens. <laughs> We've already spent the money. If they don't buy the debt, they don't buy the debt. It doesn't mean we can't spend the money. They don't even have that decision until after we spent the money. And the debt is something we offer after the fact, not something we offer ahead of time to get the money to spend. Now, that was 30 years ago. And today I see President Biden is talking about you know, getting in $2 trillion through corporate tax to pay for infrastructure. They still got it backwards. Now, fortunately, a lot of people don't have it backwards anymore. MMT is everywhere. And Congress passed the last two spending bills, large ones, trillions, without even a consideration of the idea that you have to get the money first somehow or you can't spend it. They just appropriated the money and it gets spent. And then that money that was spent is used to either pay taxes so, or not. So we've, we've been using yeah. MMT principles for a yeah. long time. Well, it's it, MMT is a, uh, a, a, Stephanie Kelton, who's an excellent proponent, calls it a lens. And I think, I'm not sure she was the first one to do that, but it's a way of looking at something everybody's been looking at, it, but you see it differently. You know, and they, they've just had the sequence backwards. And it's been backwards for a long, long time. Now, maybe it started on the gold standard where you, 
you could not spend first. You have to get the gold in or you weren't allowed to issue gold certificates. But that, that all ended on a practical level in 1934 and on a technical level in 1971. So that, you know, whether that's the reason or not is really no consequence. They've just got it backwards and, and it's wrong and it's been crippling the progressive agenda, which is why I'm concerned about it as a progressive economist. I see this as an obstacle, the progressive agenda. And when I see headline left uh, economists and congressmen still in this paradigm, it's, it's very disconcerting. So what, what's happened is the headline left has become the enemy of the progressive agenda. Now the right, you expect them to be a problem, but when the left is sort of uh, implicitly on their side, agreeing that we have to get dollars first to be able to spend, you know, it's hard enough to get this stuff through without our, you know, our friends <laughs> working against us. So why is that? Why, why is the left not uh, getting this? I don't know. You know, I had, I had, had uh, meetings several years ago with uh, Bernie Sanders staff and Bernie, and he, he was only there for 15 minutes after I spoke with the staff. And the staff got it. They had my book from 2010. I was there with one of my partners and we had a good solid discussion. And then Bernie comes in and he goes, well, you know, I'm a fiscal conservative and I'm not going to change now. I've been a fiscal conservative all my life and I'm not going to change now. And, you know, we need to tax the rich to get their money. And I'm not, you know, he probably thought I was trying to trick him out of taxing the rich or something like that. I don't know, but he, he just wasn't there. And I've yet to see anything out of him that indicates that that's, that's his, uh, his understanding. And I 100% support all his proposals in terms of Medicare for all, for example. But why don't we have Medicare for all? And you know, I'll blame Bernie Sanders because he's the one who said we need a $2 trillion tax to pay for it. So Hillary Clinton points to the tax and says, see, we can't afford this. And then we've got to work with what we have. And then and Bernie will, loses and she wins in primary and it's gone. And just time after time, I've seen it lose on this premise that we need a $2 trillion tax to pay for it. When you look at Medicare for all carefully, it's a deflationary event. I, I, you would never I, increase taxes. I, I kind of want to stop yeah. you for a second and just yeah. talk about like what is the role of taxes and, yeah. and what should okay. we be doing in trying to sell uh, yeah. the Medicare for all? Right. So um, the point, well, we, to sell Medicare for all, we have to do exactly what Stephanie says. Look at it as to whether it, it causes unemployment, it causes inflation. Or not. And if you look at it, 5 million people lose their jobs out of private sector insurance companies, which is a good thing. Those were worthless endeavors, a waste of human endeavor. And the, it's a deflationary event because prices come down everywhere. Businesses, costs are cut, sitting so there competitive, they're going to lower prices, not all business. And, uh, and so when you've got a, a unemployment going up and CPI prices flat to going down, uh, you don't raise taxes. <laughs> you look at the economy, if anything, you would cut taxes or add public services. You'd pay for Medicare for all by forgiving student debt or having free public education. That's how you pay for it, not by raising taxes. So uh, I answered the second part of your question first. Get me back to the first part. Well, in, in terms of the role of taxes. like Yeah, so what is the role of taxes? Taxes, so we have to look at what the money story is for a government like the U.S. And most economics textbooks tell a money story about People were bartering and then started using money or something, but that's not that's not relevant to today. Today's money story goes like this: You have a state, a government that wants to provision itself. It wants public health workers. It wants a military. It wants education, public education. It wants uh, all these things. And so, how does it get people out of the private sector into the public sector? How does it provision itself? Uh, if you and so the first thing it does. Now it can come up with a currency like the US dollar, but nobody knows what it is or cares what it is. And so the first thing you have to do and the first thing they do is they impose tax liabilities. They impose tax requirements. So just think about a head tax. Everybody has to pay a tax or think about a real estate tax. You can, let's, we won't talk about the complicated taxes. Now they work, but it's more complicated. So think about just a real estate tax. Everybody's got a tax on their house where they live. If you rent, the landlord has a tax that he passes through. So there's a tax on everybody's dwelling and it's payable in dollars. Well, now we've created an economy where everybody needs dollars to pay this tax. And that's the purpose of taxation. They are now sellers of their labor. They're looking for jobs that pay in dollars. They're sellers of goods and services. The farmer wants to sell tomatoes because he doesn't want to serve in the army. 
to get money to pay his tax. And we have, a, we have monetized the economy. We've created sellers of goods and services so the government can now provision itself by what it has caused to be offered for sale by spending its otherwise worthless currency. Okay, so the sequence is the government wants to provision itself. Then, uh, let me shut this off. I don't know how to shut these notifications off my computer. <laughs> okay, the government wants to provision itself, number one, so number two, it levies a tax liability, doesn't collect the tax, it puts a tax requirement in place. That creates sellers of goods and services. Now, a person trying to sell their labor to get dollars, we call that person unemployed. Unemployment is people looking for paid work. It's not people looking to volunteer at the American Cancer Society, people looking for paid work. And that's a byproduct of the creation of tax liabilities by design. Tax liabilities, in the first instance, create unemployment, people looking for paid work because the economy needs that money to pay the tax. Everybody needs dollars for one thing or another. Okay, so the government creates unemployment and then it hires the people it caused to be unemployed to serve in the government. Okay, it then pays them and then they pay the tax. And, and that ends the cycle. So the cycle ends when the government gets the money. It doesn't start there, all right? And so, um, so the question is, the government's tax liabilities have created right now, you know, 15 million more unemployed than the government wants to hire. Well, what's the point of that? All right, so either we have to hire them because they're, they're there because we created it or else lower the tax and they'll go away. The only reason they're unemployed is because of the tax. Now, as a progressive economist, I've got a lot of things we can do hiring these people right now. We have all this, what's called fiscal space, people who willing to work who can't find a job and will work for the government's money. So there's lots of room to hire these people to get done the things we want to do. Uh, some you know, conservative might prefer lowering taxes and let the private sector try and do it. I can give you a lot of reasons why I don't think that'll work, but it's, you know, it's, it would be the type of thing that you would uh, conclude is, is, a, is a thing to do next once you understand the monetary system. Okay, so it's the purpose again of taxation. There's tax liabilities, which create unemployment to provision government, and then there's a the tax payment. The purpose of the tax payment itself is just to keep people honest. If you tell people, look, you can just throw the money away, put it down the disposal, it would work. But to keep them honest, they have to pay. We can't trust them to just throw it away. So I, I want to get back to MMT. So MMT yeah. seems to suggest that yeah. we don't have to rely on taxes. No, we have to rely on tax liabilities tax to create liability. sellers. But because, because the government is the issuer of currency, we can yes. never run out of money. Right. So what is preventing us from then going big, other than the man-made restrictions that politicians have put on the process? Like okay, so what's, what's preventing us, what's, what's making it possible, let's look at it from the positive side, is what is offered for sale. Can we hire people? now to work in the Green New Deal or whatever we want to do, uh, public health. And you can look at the employment numbers and see if there are people willing to work. Now, if there aren't, if unemployment is very low and you want to hire 20 million new people for government, you're going to drive up prices hiring. You're going to have to outbid the private sector and you will cause inflation by having the government pay more for the same thing. If they're available for sale at current prices, then you can just buy them and you don't have an inflation problem. Uh, if, if you need to buy steel or glass or whatever for the government, uh, food, look at what's for sale at current prices, estimate how much you can buy at current prices without driving up price. And that will tell you, you know, what you can get. Now, it might be good policy to drive up price a little bit. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just answering your question as to what do you look at to decide what you can afford? You look at what's offered for sale. So if we were looking at our current situation right now, yes. we have you know, millions of people unemployed. Yes. This looks like it's the right economy, right? Yes. Now, or uh, a guaranteed job. Where do you stand on a guaranteed job as, as a goal of MMT? Okay, so, so we look at the tax, it's created 15 million more unemployed than the government wanted to hire, or at this moment has chosen to hire. That's, that's you know, to me, that's a crime against humanity. You know, we made a mistake. Why would anybody do that? Okay, uh, let me just give you a quick uh, example. The British went into Africa to grow coffee 
and nobody there wanted to work in the coffee plantation. So they put a tax in everybody's huts, they called them. It was a hut tax. And, and they came up with a script called Crown or something like that. You have to pay 100 Crown a month. Otherwise, the military would burn your house down. And, and how could they earn Crown? They could go down to the coffee plantation and earn the Crown. Well, they went down to the coffee plantation. Same thing, the tax created unemployment. They showed up looking for work. They hired them to grow coffee. And then they were able to pay the tax and they didn't get their house burned down. Now, they gave everyone a job who needed one uh, to prevent getting their house burned down. If they didn't need all those people, they didn't say, sorry, we're going to burn your house down. That didn't serve British policy. They either lowered the tax or they gave them some kind of job to do in the meantime and then reevaluated their tax policy. Okay, we just put a tax on everybody's house, just figuratively. You know, 15 million people can't get work and they're losing their houses. And we say, it's too bad. You know, we don't want to hire you. We, we created this unemployment with this requirement for money that you don't have. The economy doesn't have. Got the money to pay the tax comes from me, the government. And I'm not going to let you have it. I'm going to burn your house down. Ha ha. This is where we are now. I mean, this is, this is an excuse. So we have to make a decision here. We either have to hire those people to be doing government jobs or get them back in the private sector that we quote, took, took them away from, figured. Okay, the tax pulled them out of the private sector. They are in the public sector. They would not be unemployed as they are without the public sector's tax liability that pulled them out of the private sector. All non-monetized economies, economies that don't use money, none of them have an unemployment issue at all. It's never been found in any, you know, uh, America before the Europeans got here, the Indians didn't have monetary system, there's no unemployment. Africa never had unemployment. Asia never had unemployment. This is a monetary phenomenon caused by tax. So so I, I yeah. want to get back to uh, yeah. the, the need for a guaranteed job. Is yeah, that so that I'm right support? there. I'm right there. Okay. Okay. So if we decide we want them in the public sector, we just hire them all. We don't need a guaranteed job. We just hire anybody looking for a job. And we put them in different public sector jobs. If we decide we don't want them in the public sector, we don't just leave them as unemployed the way we do today and let them try and get back into the private sector because they're damaged goods. Once you become unemployed due to tax liabilities, the private sector doesn't want to hire you. You're too much of a risk. You might be on drugs. You might not take a bath every day. You might get in fights. It's, it's risky hiring the unemployed. And the longer they've been unemployed, the worse it is. We get this awful hysteresis of unemployment going on where the number over time of long-term unemployed is just, just criminal. So how do you get them back into the private sector? You offer them all a job. Anybody, anybody willing and able to work and have a public sector can have a job funded by the government. And once they're working in that job, now they become eligible for, in the eyes of private sector employers, and they will hire them into the private sector. So the purpose of the job guarantee, I call it the transition job, is to promote the transition from uh, unemployment to private sector work for those people we don't want full-time in the public sector. If we want them full-time in the public sector, Hire them a normal public pay school. That's the progressive pay scales. That's the progressive agenda. Pay public sector workers properly. We have whole pay scales for them. We don't want to start provisioning the public sector with $15 an hour people. And they'll say, oh, we're not replacing any public sector jobs. Sure you are. Those people could have been in their same public sector jobs. And long, you know, hard fought for public sector, you know, terms and conditions of employment, not under job guarantee terms. So I don't, I don't want to open up that can of worms where we start undermining the public sector pay schedule by um, the idea of using the uh, transition job, the job guarantee to provision the public sector. That should not be its primary concern. Otherwise, we get into that ugly situation and it's, it's disruptive and it's, I think it's wrong and I think it's immoral. And what, so I see it as doing what it actually does very well. It transitions people the public sector doesn't want to hire back into the private sector. What's now, perfect? they, could, they could still be hired by the public sector. Why aren't okay. we doing this now? Uh, I th I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, I use the word innocent fraud in my book, but I'll, I'll say they don't know any better, you know, rather than they're malicious. But, you know, there's no reason not to give them the benefit of the doubt. Right now. I'm not a grand I, jury. I, I had heard that you actually helped influence a guaranteed job for the Argentinian people a decade yes. or so ago. Can you yeah. talk about that? Yeah, so in 2001, the peso blew up with like 32 dead in the street in Buenos Aires, and they floated the peso. And Daniel Cozar was in the labor ministry two or three years before he'd gone to UNKC 
to uh, read up on what was called, uh, we didn't call it the job guarantee. I wrote the paper, Full Employment and Price Stability in 1996 or seven. And he read that, it was published in the post Keynesian Journal of Economics by Paul Davidson. And uh, he was on top of that. He had it inside out, offering everybody a job. Thing. And as soon as uh, it blew up in Argentina and the peso floated, he got that program through. They offered a job that it was not anyone willing to work, but it was every head of household. It's called the Hefes program, J-E-F-E-S. And uh, Hefes de Huba. And over the next couple of years, they got 2 million people into that program who never, no one ever thought would ever work. They were, that's on a population of like 33 or 35 million. It was a vast number of people. And uh, a lot of them were um, uh, disadvantaged people like Indians. And they have a very strict class system down there. And these were people at the bottom of, the, of their class structure and had never had private sector jobs, never expected to. After two years, one million of those people were hired by the private sector and they had the strongest economy in the world in terms of employment gains, GDP growth and everything else. Uh, and it was these people, it was transitioning from the, the uh, job guarantee, the transition job uh, into the uh, private sector. Uh, the public sector did not want to hire them. Okay, so would I have suggested the public sector hire them rightly as normal employees? Sure, but they weren't going to do that. But we know that they transition. Now, when you talk to other people and they tell you the success of this program, they say, oh, well, they built lots of infrastructure projects. They built a sewage treatment, you know, drainage system for this village. And they worked in soup kitchens and helped with daycare projects. And that's all true. They did, a, there was a lot of very good useful output. And I'm not downplaying that at all. But I would say, look, the government should have hired those people to do those projects. They didn't need a job guarantee for that. But they had one and they saw that these projects could be done. So now they should just hire those people into that project. But at the same time, they didn't want all 2 million doing that. A million transitioned into Buenos Aires insurance companies to work in their cafeteria who've been working in the soup kitchen in the project because they came into work, they were friendly, they got along, they were recommended by a supervisor, they were safe to hire. So it was enormously successful. I judge the success first by the transition to the private sector. Second, by the projects that were done, only because that just showed that they should have been hiring those people anyway to do those projects. I had a question here from Susan. She says, yeah. Congress can authorize the spending for whatever it wants. Yes. Whenever it wants. Yes. They are not dependent on tax revenue or bond insurance issuance. Yes. So why are they not doing it? Why do well, progressive politicians, Scott Moore? If, if it was me. Yeah. If it was me and we're limiting what we do. Yeah, if it was me and there was a, a bill introduced to spend $10 trillion to buy something, I would look to see if those things were offered for sale or if we're just going to run the prices up and just be spinning our wheels. Because you can only buy what's offered for sale. If it's not offered for sale, you're, you're just going to bid up the price and take it away from somebody else. And it has to be pretty important to do that. And so um, the uh, informed congressional representative would say no for that reason. The uninformed would say no because they think the day of reckoning is coming. We have debt to repay China or some nonsense like that. So I can't tell you who's informed and who's not informed at this time. I can tell you who I've spoken to who knows better. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that, but does that answer your question? Uh, Susan? Yes. Feel free to... I, think it does. I guess one of the things that I wanted to know as well is with the uh, corporate tax, and I know Warren is pushing that and, and Bernie and there are other progressive politicians. Yeah. Uh, corporate tax. And so my response would be, well, okay, that money can't really actually be used to fund anything at the federal level. If we do it at the federal level, at the state level, it can probably at the, yes. level, but not at the federal level. So I'm wondering if their motive is to use that as a way to reduce wealth inequality. And if, and if so, is that a way to, is that a good way to reduce wealth inequality, like from the Jeff Bezos and the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world? Or yeah. is there another thing that we need to do that would reduce wealth inequality? And would it be through a tax or would it be through a combination of other things? Yeah, right. Okay. So um, there's two part questions. I got to remember the first part. It, it uh, the corporate, let me just start off. It hits me between the eyes. 
is a corporate tax is highly regressive. Corporation is just a piece of paper. You know, if you put a tax on, you know, uh, potato chips, the price of potato, uh, potato chip companies, the price of potato chips goes up to pay for it. All the money that corporations get comes from the consumer. So if it's something like potato chips, it's a very regressive tax that you're putting on. And the majority of corporate taxes would be highly, highly regressive. So I would not, if you're going to put a tax on a corporation that builds yachts for the super rich or something, that would be different. But I, I would just regulate those out of existence. I don't think it's worth cutting down the rainforest for teak deck on somebody's 500 foot yacht, but that's, that's just me. But I would just regulate that out of existence rather than try and do it through the uh, you know corporate tax somehow. So you have to look at what it is now for the state and local governments. Yes, the corporate tax would is needed by them for accounting purposes to buy things, but it's it's much easier for the federal government just to uh, make a per capita, let's say, uh, distribution to all the state and local governments without bothering with the corporate tax. And then it would accomplish the same thing for the state and local governments. They don't really care how their account gets credited as long as it gets credited. So you got a highly regressive tax, which I'm just sort of categorically against. You'd have to give me a special situation to tell me I'm wrong. And, uh, and they're doing it out of, I think it's a narrative that has gotten them support and maybe they really believe it. I, I don't know, but, uh, and, and do I have ways to address this uh, distribution of, of consumption, distribution of income in the economy? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have ways that I think work uh, very effectively at source. I, I, so, and I'd like to say in any case, the corporate tax, A, it won't work if it worked, but it doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, just history has shown us that it doesn't do anything to address the issue they want to address. Now, let me add one more thing to give you an example. of. So um, Elizabeth Warren introduced a wealth tax or the idea of a floating idea of a wealth tax. And let's say it's 1% of everybody's bank deposits. Uh, let me just click on this thing. That means if you have $100 in the bank, a year later, you have 99. And that's a, that is a tax and it's recognized as something that reduced, presumably to reduce aggregate demand, slow down, slow down the economy. Now let's look at the uh, Federal Reserve who's been looking at the possibility of doing what the European Central Bank has done, which is a negative interest rate. Okay, so let's say they went to a minus 1% interest rate. They would do that with the idea of uh, stimulating the economy, increasing aggregate demand, trying to get inflation, unemployment lower and inflation up to, to support the economy. Yet, if I had $100 in the bank with a 1% negative income tax, at the end of the year, I'd have $99. Exactly the same outcome as Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax. It's like, what's the difference? They're both the same. Okay, they're both a tax. A negative interest rate is a tax that does exactly what Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax is, except it has the appearance of being some stimulative measure by the Federal Reserve. So, you know, would she be happy if the Fed went to a minus 1% interest rate, you know, a negative interest rate, uh, because that would accomplish what she wanted on her wealth tax or 2% or not? I don't know. But has she ever even considered that it's the same thing and to maybe rethink, you know, the whole process of how we're framing and introducing these types of things? So anyway, I, I just thought I'd throw that in. Okay. Uh, Warren, I'm going to start to take some questions from yeah. guests here. And then I'm going to come back with some more questions for you for myself. Okay. Michael's got his hand up there. Sure. And and thank you. Uh, is, is my mic level is all right? Y'all can hear me? Yeah. Nice and yes. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm really happy that you're drawing some from at least some anthropological examples as far as uh, supporting the way that you are constructing an idea of value or the, at least um, of course, that we've got a monetary system, right? Chartalism is, is what it's called from what I, I understand. So it's the idea of the origin of money. Um, and so part of the concern here is um, that one is able to have a federal government that is able to create um, is able to create money because it's, it's requiring to people to be drawn into uh, tax liabilities, right? So creating these taxes is in fact what draws people into an economic system. It draws them into the state. Uh, broadly yes, speaking. Yes. And let me and, add the money and, that the dollar is a tax credit, is the right. tax credit. Yeah. Okay, and I thank you. Uh, and so there's a lot of really good literature coming out of South America, in fact, that you bring up Argentina as an example. 
Um, actually, in Peru, there's a lot of really good uh, literature that describes precisely that, uh, levying taxes upon Indian populations in order to draw them into the state, thereby yes. bringing them into labor regimes, yes. Uh, and similarly, I actually lived in Argentina uh, shortly after the period that, that you were involved there, so after 2008 or so, I was living there, um, and have seen some things in, in regards to the way the economy kind of played out and is playing out presently. Uh, more to my point is, is actually the question of debt. So in modern monetary theory, you know, the, the concern is less about the notion of debt or even that this debt is going to be called in. Um, because one can always generate the resources necessary to continue the spending needed uh, to keep the state furnished, um, or at least provisioned is the word that you would use. Um, and so it, I'm, I'm interested about your bringing up the sort of European strategy, if you will, about, about negative, um, negative interest rates. But more importantly, why not debt abrogation or crushing debt down? And I say this specifically because of um, a David Graeber, Dr. David Graeber wrote a book called Debt, uh, which you may or may not be familiar with, but if you aren't, is really well worth looking at um, in light of moder monetary theory, because he really looks at the idea of debt, maybe not, or if actually be being the principle upon which value is derived. That is to say, so long as somebody is asking something of you, you now have to oblige them. Um, right. And so on the other side of the coin, I thank you for your patience. The other side of the coin then is if we have debts that are outstanding, could we not have a jubilee, so to speak, crushing a certain measure of national debt? Or alternatively, if we have black swan events in which there is, in fact, a large disbursement of money to the general populace, rather unlocking money otherwise locked up in the banks and then brought to people. Are, are those not legitimate strategies to address similar concerns? Okay, okay, so once you understand the debits and credits of the monetary system, those sure. questions, all, they all change. So first of all, you're talking about public debt is, what is the public debt? Okay, so it's the dollars spent by the U.S. government, tax credits. They spend first, right? Mm -hmm. Debt, some gets used to pay taxes, and the rest remains outstanding as the public debt. Right. It, it, okay, and it gets shifted from checking accounts at the Fed to savings accounts, from reserves to securities. But that's, those are just the dollars spent by the government that haven't yet been used to pay taxes. Right. So, it, and they're the money. And they're the net money supply in the economy. They're dollars in in bank accounts at the Federal Reserve Bank called the Treasury Securities. It's just a savings account. You give them money, you get it back with interest. So how do you pay back the money? It already is the money. Well, what happens mm -hmm. when a Treasury security matures? The Fed debits your securities account and credits your reserve account. They shift the money from your savings account back to your checking account. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when it matures. If you want to buy more debt, they'll shift the money from checking back to savings. So, uh, you know, it's like, how does Bank America pay off their savings accounts? Well, they take it out of your savings and put it in your checking. And if they were the only bank in the system, it would have nowhere else to go. And so uh, if you look at the Federal Reserve, uh, you know, they just, the dollars at the Federal Reserve can only go from one account to another. They can't go anywhere else. It's, a, it's inside money. And the government spends by crediting an account. That, that account then has a balance. Th those are the dollars the government spent that haven't been used to pay taxes. That's the public debt. They haven't been used to pay taxes. It's very simple. And if you move them to another account called the Treasury Security, called the savings account, okay, it's still an account at the Federal Reserve. So there's nothing to pay back. And that becomes the net money supply in the, in the economy. Those that are the net financial assets in the economy to the penny. When the CBO determines net financial assets, that's what they look at. Okay, and so a growing economy has a growing money supply. Our economy has $26 trillion of net financial assets that we call treasury securities that are the equity behind our entire credit structure, private credit structure. Okay, now, if you're talking about private sector credit, that's a different animal. So sure. I'll give you the uh, benefit of the doubt and say you were talking about private sector credit. Uh, to, I mean, to a large extent, so, yes. Yeah, so the idea go of ahead, the federal go government paying off its debt is not an applicable question with today's policy, floating exchange rate, that type of thing. It's just the only thing that they will give you for a $10 bill is two five. You can't get any gold or anything like that, right? The government, the Fed, they'll just make change. These are just tax credits. And they're they're all just tax credits. So there's, there's nothing to pay off. Now, uh, 
private sector debt is a different story. State debt, whatever, is a different story. That is something that does need to be you know, repaid. That is your marker that needs to be repaid with U.S. government tax credits. And we already have jubilee with that. It's called bankruptcy. The bankruptcy laws are today's jubilee laws. And we can do anything we want with the bankruptcy laws. We can say anybody can go bankrupt and never have to pay anything back. Now, every 10 years, you're allowed to go bankrupt. Every 20 years, you're allowed. You're not allowed to securitize your house with a mortgage. Uh, we, can co- we can come up with any, any bankruptcy laws we want, and th- those will have consequences in terms of your ability to get credit, which might be okay. So the only reason you can borrow money privately is because the government will enforce you, you know, the uh, payback of that money. If we don't enforce, if there are no laws on requiring anyone to pay back their money, if you don't pay the bank and they have no recourse, then you have your jubilee and probably won't get a loan to begin with. So, uh, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but we do have complete jubilee and it's all in the bankruptcy code. And that is subject to legislative change. All right, I wanna move on to the next question here. Um, Robert, you've had your hand up there for a while. Yes. Um, I have a question concerning um, um, the auction situation of, of bonds in the in the Fed or in the Treasury and how that connects up. I'm still yeah. a little bit confused on that. Okay. So we have a policy that says the Treasury is not allowed to have a negative balance in its account at the Fed. It happens from time to time and gets covered, but it's, it's the general policy. Uh, I call that a... Um, self-imposed constraint. It's not inherent in monetary operations. We've decided to put that in. It's like if you take your shoes and you tie the shoelaces to each other, and now you can't walk very well, you can just shuffle. And you say, yeah, you know, human beings have problems walking. Well, yeah, they just tied their shoelaces. Okay, so uh, yes, that's there. So (laughs) we have the self-imposed constraints. So the treasury has to go out and sell securities to have a balance in its Fed account. Now it's first before it can spend, but the the private sector doesn't have any dollars to pay for those securities. So how do we solve this? The treasury lends the dollars to the private sector to to buy the, I'm sorry, the Fed lends the dollars to the private sector or gives them an open line of credit to be able to buy treasury securities, which the Fed will then uh, lend them the money to pay for it. And then those dollars can then go into the account of the treasury and now the treasury can spend. So it's kind of our, whoop de doo little game they play. It's called, uh, it's a, the setup is the, called the primary dealer setup. Mm-hmm. There used to be 40. Now I think there's 20 something primary dealers. And um, they all have lines of credit to the Fed. They can buy all the treasury securities they want. The treasury securities are sold at auction and the primary dealers have to participate or they will lose their status as primary dealers. Mm-hmm. So I was a primary dealer. I mean, Bankers Trust was a primary dealer when I worked there and we would lose money year in and year out. Not a lot, a little bit on this primary. And I saw that on the statement. I go to the trading manager, why are we a primary dealer? You know, the, the treasury has the game rigged, so we're all losing money. He says, well, we have to, because if we're not a primary dealer, then the large accounts like state of California, state of New York, won't do business with us. So in order to keep our clientele, we've got to contribute to this thing called <laughs> the primary dealer arrangement. Now, I'm not sure they're still losing money today, but they probably are, because I think treasury kind of likes it that way. It gets them off the hook for saying, we're not paying anybody to do this for us. And the primary dealers are okay because they're making enough money on their other clients to uh, make it worth their while. But, and, but um, and at, back then, several of the smaller primary dealers dropped out because they didn't see the value of you know, losing money on this arrangement. So then, anyway, it comes down to the fact that the treasury can sell an infinite amount of short-term bills anytime it wants to f- flood its account with dollars. There's no restriction. All right. Okay. Now you have the you have the uh, the um, interest rate is it is coupled to that? Is it not? No. Well, it, the Fed sets a policy rate. It uh, could it it could couple it, but it sets an overnight rate, which it enforces. Look, the overnight rate will be zero. Balances at the Fed will not earn interest unless the Fed pays interest on those balances. They can't go anywhere. So now it's paying interest on reserves, which is interest on balances. And treasury securities are interest on balances in securities accounts and the savings accounts. So in the absence of 
the Fed, the Treasury paying interest on, on the dollars on deposit there, the rate would be zero. So what they do is these policies are there to support interest rates just at the Fed's policy rate. So if the Fed's policy rate is zero, it doesn't have to do anything. It doesn't have to pay interest on reserves and the Treasury doesn't have to sell securities. Now, because we have this self-imposed constraint of tying our shoes together, I've proposed we leave rates at zero permanently and that the Fed just sell, uh, the Treasury not sell anything longer than the three month bill, which is basically the same as cash. And uh, there's no money to be made doing that or lost. In it. Uh, I'm gonna move to uh, Brad's question. Brad's gonna yeah. stand up there. Brad, can you hear me? I think we're trying to fix his mute. Uh, it doesn't show that he's mute, but we'll come back to Brad. Hey, Robert. Yes. Let me say, okay, so number one critical was sequence. And you can see how that's been addressed answering these questions. Once you have the sequence right, these questions that used to be questions change the nature. And that's what's happened. The nature of the debate is changing in Washington. Number two, hasn't changed yet. And it's imperative that it does. And that is they've got the interest rate thing backwards. Higher rates from the Fed causes inflation. They don't fight inflation. So we've got people saying, look, if we spend more, it causes inflation, the Fed raises rates, we're in big trouble because of all the interest we're going to have to pay. Well, why would the Fed raise rates if they knew that that caused more inflation? They wouldn't. And that whole argument would go, go by the wayside. So I think right now it's critical for MMT proponents to understand why and how raising rates causes inflation and why we've got to get the Fed educated so that we can get that fear mongering out of the current debate to open the door for progressive agenda, because that is holding it up. It's okay, it's okay to run deficits now because rates are low and we're not paying, we're paying less in interest. But we got to do it now because if rates go up, they're not. Well, if the Fed's raising rates, it's going to cause inflation, which it does and it has every time they've done it in the past. They think it's fighting inflation, but it's not, it's causing it. Do they? Do you think they actually don't know this or they don't it, know this i've talked to them so I, why why are, they, why are they on the in the position that they're in how did they they're in a position that? from fixed exchange rates gold standard where markets determined interest rates and you wrote raise rates to attract reserves to prevent yourself from um devaluing but the evidence the price of gold what they're holding it's all an anachronism it's a right. massive anachronism so I, i'm suggesting we need to get other people appointed to the fed who actually understand MMT. No? Yeah, whatever it takes, because it's got to be done quickly. Because otherwise, MMT proponents are going to, they don't get on this and they're not. Mm. They're not paying attention to this. They're going to go the way of the Keynesians, you know, in the 70s, mm. uh, where suddenly they get discredited. The Fed raises rates and they weren't warning about it. They have no answer. They're not out there saying it's backwards. And uh, and they just go quiet and, and they go away. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want them to lose their credibility. It would appear that, you know, MMT has been working fairly well. When you look at the bank bailouts of what, 15 years ago or so, all that money the Fed put into the money supply yeah. didn't cause inflation, did not. Didn't well, let me, let, me, yeah, let me tell you why. And it's not that MMT is working well. MMT analysis is accurate, is what you're saying, has been correct. Okay, so you've got money in what's called reserve accounts. That's when the, those are your checking accounts at the Fed. Now, when you move money from checking to savings, when you buy treasury securities, those treasury securities are not counted in the narrow measures of money supply. They're only counted in the very broad measures, which they don't use anymore. So all the Fed has done is shift back by buying securities, doing QE, is they've shifted money from checking accounts at the Fed to savings accounts, which I back I started on this in 1997 and 8 when Japan started doing it. It's like, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to cause inflation. It's not going to cause the currency to go down any more than Bank America or Citibank shifting money, offering you a return on savings to move out of your checking. It's going to cause any macroeconomic events. Nobody even pays attention to that because it's got nothing to do with it. And so the Fed hasn't added any money except under too narrow of a definition to be of any value under any normally broad definition. Money supply is unchanged. Warren, what about all this money that's just been allotted just in the last year with President Trump in Congress? Yeah, that's fiscal spending. Fiscal that does spending. add. That does add to the money supply, net financial assets. That's what you look at, not the Fed. The well, Fed's not, not doing anything. We're not seeing a immediate effect on inflation right now. Right. So doesn't that? Sh I guess where I'm getting at is let me let me explain why. 
Don't answer it so, yet. I want to put okay. out the big picture of like, if we're already seeing how just having debt doesn't cause the sky to fall. Okay? That's right. That's right. Why aren't we then moving in the direction of, you know, paying for Medicare for all, paying for a Green New Deal, you know, the Thrive Program, whatever we want to call it. Yeah. What's, is, why isn't, I guess I'm frustrated that things aren't, don't happen. Yeah, yet. I know. Once you figure out, you know, how things work. Yeah. Yeah, th then those questions are not applicable. You know, so um, in the economy, personal income is way up because of all the uh, fiscal transfers that you talked about, all the trillions of dollars. But spending is not up. Consumption is down. Why? It's because people spend income, which is up. People also borrow to spend. Car payments, house payments, all kinds of borrowing, credit card payments to go to the movies or whatever. Okay. Borrowing to spend is way down. So that component of spending is down. Now, why is it down? Is it down because people just don't feel like spending because of COVID? Um, or is it down because when you're out of work, you don't qualify to, to borrow money anymore? I'm not sure. Okay, I haven't, I haven't done the surveys. You know, I don't have any way to do that. But if borrowing to spend were at, was at the same level it was at pre-COVID, then we would have a spending issue now where spending would be exploding from all this public sector deficit spending. So the public sector deficit spending has been replacing the, the drop in private sector deficit spending, new investment, corporate deficit spending, it's not there. Okay, so it's been replacing that. And it, that stuff has faded away. So you have to watch that very carefully to make sure you don't you know, overcook things. So, so what do you what do you suggest should be happening right now? Uh, right now, uh, you know, all, all kinds of things. I don't know if you want to save that. Give me, give me but, your top, um, top three. Yeah. So um, Medicare for all immediately, which is a deflationary event, puts five billion more people out of work. So we have to address that problem, but we need to redeploy those people into a whole lot of other things, such as public education. So we need free public education. Uh, we need all kinds of public health initiatives. We need um, infrastructure, but we don't need, I, I have an interesting thought on that. We don't want infrastructure that, you know, we just can go faster, high-speed rail and all of these things. It's, it's got to, look, speed, we used to say, speed costs money. How fast do you want to go? You know, you go twice as fast, you can be burning up four times the energy. So we've got to reassess the importance of all this speed that we're thinking it's fun and it's convenient and you know, a Tesla can go zero to 60 in two seconds, but is that the direction we want to go? I mean, you burn a lot of energy going zero to 60 that fast. Is that what we want to do? Is that why we want to build power plants and everything else to facilitate this type of thing? Um, and so in terms of what we're doing, I mean, every aspect of what we're doing needs to be re-examined in this light as to what are we doing on the resource level? What are we doing on you know, human development level? Uh, what are we doing for preschools? What are we doing for personal attention for children who have issues? You know, what are we doing for, you know, not only just healthcare that's there, but actually, you know, getting it to people and uh, doing it effectively. How about medical research? Why haven't we just written a check for hundred billion for cancer research to qualifying universities? What's stopping us from doing that? Cancer is still, you know, serious problem. Once we know that we can do this, as long as the researchers are available, as long as the test tubes are available and the uh, x-ray machines, whatever these guys need, now we can go flat out and make serious progress you know, against uh, all these diseases, which I think have a much higher priority than a lot of other things we're talking about. I'm gonna to switch to some of the people that have been waiting to ask questions. Yeah, sorry. Susan, uh, you're, you're up. Um, actually, I've already spoken, so I just, I'm going to hand it off to Brad. I see there's other people that want to ask questions as well, so I want to give them a chance to speak. All right. so I'll hand it off to Brad, and then there's a couple. I think Alex is after that, and then Gonzo. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to you. Brad, are you there? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. I can hear you all along, but apparently my mic was muted. I didn't realize it. Anyways, uh, Warren, my question is... Um, about the uh, infrastructure bill that's uh, currently being proposed by uh, Mr. Biden and yeah. all the talk around how you're gonna pay for it and all that baloney. And 
I was wondering um, how that fits in with your description of Medicare for all, and it would actually require a tax cut. And I was wondering if that would apply also to what is out there anyways for the uh, infrastructure plan. And yeah, well, the bigger one. So the way I'd say it is the infrastructure plan would pay for the Medicare for all. Because Medicare for all <laughs> saves the country about a half a trillion dollars a year in real expense. And that those real resources could be redirected towards infrastructure, which would be a whole lot more than President Biden's talking about. First of all, the package is tiny, over eight years. Um, they're going to fix a bridge somewhere. And I don't think they've addressed the issue of how you actually fix this infrastructure because we saw it under Obama's administration. We've seen it at state and local levels and FEMA levels. New Orleans is still trying to get through the process of getting you know, their repair, restorations going. How many years is that? And the whole federal process of getting these things funded and done and contracted and bid and everything else drags on. This could drag on for 20 years. We never see it. So we've got a, a bureaucratic issue that, to be polite, that, you know, we've got to like address to be able to effectively get these things done. You can't just sign a note and appropriate money and expect infrastructure to actually happen, you know, at the magnitude and the level we can afford and we'd like it to happen. So uh, uh, federal government's got a lot of work to do on it. So yeah, interface. It two years just to figure out what we have to do. Yeah, yeah. At least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, one of my proposals for infrastructure was some of it's federal, but some of it just give uh, grants to the state governments to get it done. And the only thing they owe the federal government is an accounting at the end of the year of what they've done to show their voters when they run for re-election. So you got $10 billion, $100 billion, California, federal infrastructure money, what did you do? At the end of the year, they have to account for it, show it to their voters to decide if that's how they want it done. Now, there are some projects that need to be coordinated nationally, I understand. I'm gonna to move to Alex with the next question. So um, I, I became aware um, of, of your, your work partly through Yanis uh, Varoufakis, and in particular, what you say about um, sequence really helped me understand when he was trying to set up the parallel uh, payment system using tax credits to transition to um, uh, retransition re to the drachma. And, and he strikes me is very keyed into um, the MMT lens and this sort of stuff. And I find some of his um, pr proposals interesting and fresh. And my, my, my feeling is, is like with a, a universal basic income is that you're not particularly in favor of that because of the moral hazard. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with his, his take on it, um, where he, he calls it a universal dividend. And the idea is we all contribute to the capital of Google when we use Google search engines. So we should all, you know, uh, get, get a dividend from it. And I, I know you were saying about the, the you know, corporate tax structure can be regressive. Um, so I was wondering if you had any opinions on on how um, if it's still regressive when it's sort of a, a redistributive mechanism rather than a funding mechanism. Yeah. So what what it is functionally is a tax cut, right? So um, just a different sign. So for, let's go back to Africa where the British put a tax on everybody's hut. They all showed up to work and they paid them to grow coffee and then they paid the tax. Okay. So. What would have happened if they said, you know, we feel sorry for all these people who want to work. They shouldn't have to do that. How about if we just give them all enough money to pay the tax? Well, that's fine. But then there's nobody showing up to grow coffee. All right. So if the government has a tax on everybody's house and then it gives us basic income enough to pay the tax, so we don't have to have the anxiety of the taxes introduced, which is probably, you know, a level of anxiety unmatched of anything else in the history of humanity. Uh, and it's ongoing and it's pervasive and it affects art, it affects everything. It's just like a, it's, it's a really sinister uh, intrusion on the psyche. And anyway, um, let's just give them all enough money so they don't have to pay it, so they can pay their tax. Well, now the government can't use its otherwise worthless currency to provision itself. It's now a worthless currency again. There's nobody showing up to be a soldier or public health worker who wants that money in return. So if you do it for anything less than that, fine, it'll still function. So I, I'm not categorically against it, but you have to understand you're playing with fire and it does make up for a lot of the uh, complex, you know, the uh, 
regressivity and complexity in our tax codes to uh, exempt people from having to pay a tax. It's one way to do it. But if you don't understand what it is, a couple of years can go by and it's working. And it, it is a fallacy of composition. Well, let's just give everybody a little bit more and bang, you go over the edge and the whole system collapses. So that's why I say it's playing with fire. You're threatening the government's ability to provision itself, which is the whole point of the exercise. So as long as you're aware of that and it's targeted in such a way that it's not, let's say, truly universal or, uh, you know, but again, and then what, the, what it's supposed to accomplish, I can come up with other ways that are not dangerous to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish without threatening the government's ability to provision itself. So I, again, I'm not categorically against it. It's playing with fire, and there are better ways to do the same thing, you know, in, in my opinion. All right, T. We're going to go with a question from Gonzo. Yes. Hello, Warren. Hello, everyone. Oh. Um, my question is um, if deficit spending by the government adds net financial assets, adds money to, to the economy. What happens when uh, the private sector starts borrowing again and creating money via banks? How do we uh, eliminate those net financial assets that we added before in order to, to prevent inflation from occurring? Yeah. So what you're talking about is a private sector credit expansion will uh, fuel spending. It's always about spending. It's not about the money being out there. If you borrow money and just put it in your savings account and don't do anything with it, it doesn't affect anything. It's when you spend it. So an increase in private sector borrowing to spend uh, can drive up prices. And that's why prices tend to go up during times of expansion because the private sector does that. There's more mortgages, price of homes go up, so there's more mortgage borrowing. It's all pro-cyclical. Private sector is necessarily pro-cyclical, which is what you're talking about. And so as that happens, you can look at it and you can say, okay, we'll let five or 6% inflation, it's okay. If you don't like it, uh, don't forget inflation doesn't get started and then runs away in terms of Zimbabwe. That's done through deliberate policy that has to contribute to that inflation every year or else it's gonna stop. You, it takes a lot of work to keep it, an inflation going. The government has to pay higher and higher prices, which is the other thing that comes out of sequence. We have a simple public monopoly the price level is a function of prices paid by government. No other economic school of thought has that knowledge. They all look at it as inflation expectations. They have no understanding of the source of the price level. We do, right down to the penny, really. It's prices paid by government. They're the monopolist. Monopolists are price setter. It's economics micro 101. Okay, it takes 15 minutes. It's very simple. All right, so do you want to allow price increases, figuring it's going to bring out supply, you're talking about a relative value story, uh, et cetera. The, the thing is, I've been watching markets for 50 years now, and I've never seen an inflation caused by that phenomenon. I've seen that happen many times. And usually the cycle ends for some other reason, but it never got to the point where you had an inflation of any consequence, three, four, five percent, and then it backs off because uh, we had such a strong countercyclical tax code that the deficit actually came down, you know, as the private sector credit expanded, the government deficit shrinks even faster. So in 1997, 98, 99, we had private sector credit growing at 7% a year of GDP. It was an incredible growth. And the government deficit came down just as fast and went into a 3% surplus because of the uh, aggressive uh, uh, counter-cyclicality of the tax code. So, um, so we already have what are called automatic stabilizers in place that tend to be more aggressive than the private the growth of private sector credit and actually work to cause the economy to, to stall and go into reverse. That's what reversed the, the expansion in 2000. That's what it reversed in 2007. The deficit got down to 1% of GDP during that um, uh, real estate boom because of the boom. And, um, and you can go through each cycle and you can show how fiscal the automatic stabilizers are so aggressive that they brought a good economy down by taking, you know, uh, the growth of that net money supply just evaporated. So 
short answer, we, we already have automatic stabilizers in place, which I think are too aggressive. And they will right now automatically offset those uh, private sector credit increases. All right, All right. We have a question from Holly. Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you also, Mr. Mosler, uh, for uh, your, your presentation. Now, um, I, I am uh, you know, not an economist at all, but, I, but um, every time you talk about taxing as the government's need to provision itself, um, what pops into my head is the Magna Carta. And you know, that goes back a long way. I mean, if, you, if we're gonna talk about taxation as the need of the government to provision itself, it seems as if, I, as I've uh, uh, understood modern monetary theory, uh, taxation is more grounded in the ability of the government to enforce collection of money. Uh, so, so that, in other words, you 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 came you you mentioned this very quickly when you talked about the uh, you know I'll burn your house down. Uh, yes. That's empire, right? Uh, yeah. uh, domestically, I really don't know too much about how that works its way out. How uh, the coercive effect of government to to collect taxes has worked, um, uh, other than militaristically or through some form of violence or another. Now that is also traditionally those are national national boundaries, nationally bounded areas where governments work. Um, and I, I'd like you to speak to that. To uh, uh, as I first uh, encountered modern monetary theory, it was tied up with something called sovereign currency. And uh, sovereign currency uh, is, as I understood it, maybe I'm wrong, uh, nationally bounded. Certain currencies, right, uh, are not tied to the dollar, are not sovereign currencies. The dollar is a sovereign currency, and so on. Um, now, in that context, uh, perhaps you could talk about the need for political boundaries in order for any of this to work uh, for national boundaries. And could you also then uh, speak to what is now being suggested uh, as a global taxation of corporations like Google um, and, and uh, the, the, you know, how this would affect your theories uh, if it were possible to institute or if it was done, uh, uh, global taxing entities, what, what sort of government would be provisioned from that? Okay, so what, what's the first question? I'm sorry. You strung several well, things well, the together. First, well, uh, all right, let's just, uh, just go to <laughs> national boundaries. Where, how, how needed are political boundaries in order for, uh, as, as, a, as an unspoken prior first step to any of this to work? Okay, so uh, it all begins with taxing authority. And so you have to be able to uh, put on tax liabilities that are enforceable. Otherwise, if nobody has to pay the tax. They're not going to work. To, they're not going to want that currency. There's not going to be any demand for the tax credit without a tax. A tax credit only has value if there's a tax. The dollar is simply a tax credit. It has value to people because it extinguishes a tax liability and they're willing to work to get it. If there was no recourse, if they didn't pay, then uh, they're not going to work to get it. And you're, you're back where you started from. So it's absolutely dependent on coercion. The IRS's ability to enforce the tax code. Without that, uh, there's nothing. It's a non-starter. And, yeah, and there, well, okay. So in other words, I think what you were talking about before is if you don't pay your taxes, you lose your house. Yeah, there, or you, that, or you go to- That's the jail. economy. That is, you know, that's the economy enforcing uh, the ability of the government to tax. It, and, Right. That's the IRS coming in and taking the house away and putting it up for sale to pay your taxes. That's the IRS taking your car. The IRS, you know, attach your paycheck. The IRS will put you in jail if you for tax fraud. I mean, it's it's the most brutal agency we have. Well, I, I don't know if you've it ever was been, the bank that would come and repossess your house. Am I wrong? For not paying the taxes? IRS? No, that's for not paying a, a loan to the bank. The IRS will do that for not. They'll put a tax lien on anything for not paying your taxes. For even suspecting that you might not have paid your tax, first thing they do is put a lien on all your property. Then they take you to court to enforce it. But I, I don't know if you've ever been audited, but they're, they're the worst. I mean, it's and they seem to find people who enjoy doing it, which makes it even that much worse. You know, they, they are they are the, the individuals in there act like you know you're the enemy of the state because of this. That's so what, do you need? Okay, so do you need sovereign governments? 
nations. Well, nations, I, don't, I don't use the word sovereign government because it, it, the definition is a kind of a moving target. It was originally started, I think, by Randy Ray for the idea that you have to have a floating exchange rate rather than a fixed exchange rate. And then it became, uh, I don't know, no foreign debt or something. I, I, but I, I, I do well without using that term. Uh, I've never found the need to use that term. But anybody with taxing authority can do it. We've got the University of Missouri with Kansas City. Now, Kansas City put a tax on their students. They have taxing authority to create the, the buckaroo, their student currency. And they said to your students, you have to pay us a tax of 20 buckaroos every semester or else you're not going to get your grades. And to earn buckaroos, you have to do community service. Okay. And, and so the hospital, work at the hospital for an hour, you know, the police department volunteer, and you'll get, you know, one buckaroo per hour. And I created a, that currency there and then at Denison College with uh, Fado, and then Franklin University with uh, uh, Andrea Terzi, Professor Terzi. And all these three student currencies are perfectly functioning currencies like the dollar or the yen because the schools have the ability to enforce this tax, this collection. Now, are they sovereign currencies? I guess, I don't know. But you don't, I mean, using that word doesn't, I don't think adds anything. You just, taxing authority is what it's all about. You can call what's, it whatever you want. What's a global want. taxing authority? What's, what's a global what, what, tax? Okay, so I, I'm not sure. I think what the United States wants to do is tax its corporations that are headquartered in the U.S. if they earn money overseas. You know, so if, if Apple has a branch in Ireland or something, they want to be able to tax that in the U.S. Actually, I think it's gone a step beyond that. But I'll thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, maybe it has. Maybe it has. But yeah. it's all like... You know, if you think of just the compliance costs for all this stuff, the tax code, that's a highly regressive tax, you know, on corporations, on individuals that could be, um, you know, replaced with a progressive tax with no compliance costs. I, I talked to a friend of mine, a professor at the University of Chicago, mainstream economist. He thinks the compliance costs for our tax codes, our transactions tax codes, sales tax, income tax, are 15% of GDP. That's all the human endeavor that's tied up in this stuff from record keeping to compliance, to going to school to learn it, to courts, to all this overseas stuff that's set up, you know, and all the energy that's burned and all the computer time and everything else. It just completely goes away if we don't try and do this. So, yeah, it, it's, it's disturbing to me that they just keep adding to this monster of uh, unproductive human endeavor that directly takes away from a real standard of living. These are pe brilliant people that could go out and cure cancer who are instead, instead they're tax lawyers or something like that, or their accountants setting up these intricate schemes. Instead of, so instead of having cures for cancer, we've got, you know, the best tax you know, schemes in the world. It's like, this is, this is like, I don't know. It bothers me. I think you can tell. So we got a few yeah, more it's questions. Just, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, we have a go few ahead. questions and then we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, next is Susan uh, Eldridge. Yeah, so um, just to, just to kind of extend on the tax thing a little bit. So I understand yeah. that uh, apparently uh, FDR put the Social Security in the uh, the yeah the Social Security tax because he knew, according to the uh, Luther Gulick memo, he understood that the, that it wasn't necessarily like financially. And Luther Gulick was trying to say, you know, we really don't need to do this. It's not going to be inflationary, etc. And he said, yeah, I get it, but I want people, I'm doing this for a political reason. I want people to feel like they have, you know, skin in the right. game, so to speak. And, and it will be harder for future generations to take it away. And yes. I've kind of seen it as a double-edged sword. I mean, on the yes. one yes, people feel like I paid into this, don't take it away, but it hasn't really stopped anyone from trying to take it away and, you know, chip away at it and, and try to destroy it and say that we don't have enough money to keep this program going. Yes. Yeah. People paying taxes. So, yeah. Um, like, I guess I get you thinking about tax policy and like, should, so, you know, if we don't need, should we get rid of FICA? Should we get rid of the social security and, and the Medicare tax and just do like a straight progressive tax based on ability to pay the tax since we all have to pay a tax because that's, you know, it's required that we pay taxes. So we can't just get rid of federal taxation, but if we did it strictly on a progressive taxation, would that be uh, a better approach or is it better to make people think that they're paying into it so that they'll fight more for the program? You know, I had this discussion with Dean Baker. Do you know who he is? Uh, yeah, I've, I've heard of him. That was three or four years ago at his CPR, CPR whatever his institute is, um, Center for Economic Policy. And he's progressive. 
and it's called a useful fiction. And he, you know, I have a whole chapter on social security and how it's a useful, how it's a fiction. And, it shouldn't, uh, and it's, and I thought my position is as an academic, as an educator, which a lot of MMT proponents are, they need to just tell it like it is. And it's either you believe in an informed electorate or you don't, right? And I believe in an informed electorate. And Dean didn't. He thought that if that ever happened, then the program would be at risk. And the only way to save the program is to try and continue this useful fiction and not go the way of MMT. And so he was never an uh, MMT proponent because he didn't trust that knowledge in the hands of voters or individuals or anybody else. So that's kind of a philosophical point. You know, either you believe in an informed electorate or you don't. I do. And once you do, then you come up with a whole different narrative and a whole different set of proposals and different conclusions as to what you want in those proposals. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael, you had a question? I do, thank you. Um, I, I actually just wanna return really quickly to um, to your analysis on what was going on kind of at the same time, uh, at the time that Italy was defaulting um, on, its, on its obligations. And uh, my understanding is that at the time you, you believe that Italy somehow or another would come out of it uh, at least with, with less damage than was originally anticipated. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested to see how you would compare this to what ended up occurring in Argentina after 2001, particularly because if my understanding is correct, that the national or the federal reserves in Argentina were uh, corralled. Well, actually, quite literally, that's what they called it, corralito. But they were corralled and then brought to um, those who were holding their debts. And that's that's been a drama that's played out after uh, for some years since then. Um, so if I may just kind of briefly, what played out differently in Italy than in Argentina? And does that have any relationship to the role that the state is able to play in terms of being an active active role, we'll say, in, in the individual citizen's life? Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, what, what year Italy are you talking about? 1992 or 2012? Uh, 1992. So the, the oh, time that I believe you were, yeah, you were yeah. most uh, interested economically there. Right, right. So, uh, well, no, I was there in 2012. Also. But, understood, um, understood, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, back then, uh, they had thrown floating exchange rates, same as Argentina. They didn't have yes. the foreign debt issue. Okay, so mm -hmm. that just wasn't something they had to be concerned about. So, Argentina had the, uh, the dollar bonds, right. and um, which is a whole interesting situation. I did a whole presentation on that to a, a group down there not too long ago, maybe a year ago. And uh, I can send you a copy of it. I, I would love to, yeah, can I would love it. to take a look at that, thank you. But, yeah, okay, so um, and, and, and what their strategy could be going forward. But even mm -hmm. with all those uh, those issues of foreign debt, um, because the peso is their currency, they spend first before taxes can be paid, et cetera, they can always hire the unemployed. They can always, uh, facilitate the private sector hiring the unemployed. They can always support full employment uh, policy. And so I've got a paper called Exchange Rate Policy and Full Employment on my website. It's only three or four pages. It's MoslerEconomics.com. So uh, to check that out first. Okay. And then, um, I, you know, it's warren.mosler at gmail.com. You can always contact me. Okay. Uh, I thank you. Yeah. I, I'm. Thank you much. Then, I appreciate then I'll try and get you that presentation in Argentina, but it, you know, it's got some issues, but basically for the most part, that debt is non-recourse. There's not a lot those uh, bondholders can do. And, um, you know, there are certain things they can do. Like I remember the president's plane was impounded or something like that, but that's yes, yes. kind of well, so minor stuff around the edges. Yeah. If I may, and this is what concerns me is because there yeah. have been uh, papers published recently, recently from the Financial Times within the last week or two. Uh, discussing the way in which, um, you know, Chinese debt traps, so to speak, or the Chinese Communist Party has really taken some inroads into South America, pointing yeah. particularly at Argentina, um, yeah. you know, pointing particularly at Bolivia. And my sense of things as they head toward a presidential election in the next week or so, uh, Peru will probably be looking at similar things. Um, yeah. You know, this is what concerns me is, is 
um, you know, the way in which debt leverage is utilized against nation states. Yes, um, it, and it how is. you might speak to those. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, the nations don't understand their options. They get rewarded for playing along with the IMF, for playing along with China. They get personally rewarded. Their biggest problem down there is, you know, an intense level of corruption. If yes. you, uh, you Google uh, Venezuela corruption or something, you know, you'll see some guy in Miami walk, you know, got, I don't know how many zillion bolivars sold, you know, from the banking system through insiders, sold them for $2 billion, bought property in Miami. That's one guy for $2 billion. The actual number is going to be staggering. And they're just using the political system to bleed the wealth off and to get foreign exchange for the conspirators, let's call them, whoever they are. Yeah. And it's a large web of people, and it includes people involved in the state-owned enterprises. And it causes currency depreciation. They do it through currency depreciation. They sell their local currency to get foreign exchange. They really don't care how far down it goes or how high the inflation is, as long as they're getting their dollars or their yen or whatever, euro, out of you know the transaction into their accounts. And they all participate. And it's been going on for a long time, 50 years sure. or something. I mean, maybe maybe a thousand years. I don't know. But it's uh, when you get these jobs in government, it's like you won the lottery. Now it's your turn to to do this to everybody else. That's how they all see it. And, and yeah. so, and it's indeed very unique with with Argentina specifically. And I'll yeah, not, sure. I mean, I'll not, I'll not bore the audience with with the particulars of it. But as somebody who spent a, a good deal of time living and working there. Uh, and has come to know the country pretty pretty intimately. The, the, do, I, do I have three minutes to relay a story of Argentina? You have, if, I have, you have my time. Absolutely. Go ahead. So I, I go down. Daniel did the Hefe's program. They've gone. And then, a few, then he left the labor ministry. And then the next guy in took the, his budget and did something else with it. So it was still sort of there, but going away. And they were a couple of years later, they're faced with labor shortages. We thought it would be a good idea to restart this program. So he invites me down to talk to people in Buenos Aires, and I go down with uh, Jan Kregel. So the three of us go down. And one of the meetings is at a progressive institute, which had, I don't know, 10 central bankers in it or something, 20 of them in there, and we're all wearing suits. And it was a very, uh, you know, middle-aged group. And I started explaining why they should reinstate this program of offering a job to anybody who wants one in order to uh, make that population attractive to the private sector so they wouldn't have labor shortages to grow their economy. So one of them asked me a question. He says, well, how much are you going to pay these people? So I said, well, what's the minimum wage? And they said, like, 600 pesos a month or something, which is, you know, $200 or something. And I said, well, maybe half that, 300 pesos, because, you know, in 2001, 2002, it was only 100, and the people there were willing to work rather than, they were all asked, would you like to work and get paid, or would you rather stay home and just get the money? And every one of them wanted to go to work. Show mm -hmm. what they could do and hopefully transition to private sector. So anyway, I said maybe 300 pesos a month. So he says to me, quote, well, if we give those people that much money, some of them might eat some meat. <laughs> okay. So mm -hmm. Daniel turns right red. Jan starts rolling his eyes like he was United Nations Development Economy. really good. One of the, you know, probably the best in the world. He's like nodding and saying, like, I warned you about these this is a progressive institute. So, you know, I'm a little irreverent. And I, don't, I don't miss a beat. I just say to him, well, look, if the purpose of your current institutional arrangements is to make sure a substantial part of your population isn't ever going to eat any meat, you're already doing a good job. You really don't need to hear the rest of this presentation. <laughs> so he turns around and addresses the other group in Spanish for a couple of minutes. Turns around and comes back to me and he says, well, We've decided it might be okay if they ate some meat, so we'd like to hear the rest of the presentation. <laughs> so that's who you're dealing with down there. Fair, yeah, it was, it's like, like, it was shameless. The whole thing was shameless. Yeah, the, the, the project of clientelism is something endemic to Argentine democracy and yeah. um, is, is a very, very uh, sensitive subject and, in fact, is a, an animating uh, presence in the local economy as well as uh, political economy. And, if you have uh, a dinner, and, if you have a dinner down there, and there's a yeah. level 13 government employee sitting next to a level 14. They won't talk to each other. Their class yeah. structure down there, just under the surface, from what I found, this was 15 years ago, was, sure. you know, this to call it rigid was an understatement. It was severe, yeah. intense. Yeah, 
Um, well, nonetheless, I'll 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 leave it I'll leave it as such. But I thank you very much yeah. for your contribution. Okay. Sure. Um, I I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, Ron, if you don't mind, we have like three more questions. Then we're going to wrap it up. Sure, take your time. Uh, Teddy, you had a question. Um, we're not hearing you though, Teddy. Is your mic on? It looks like it is. So, and worst comes to worst, if you want to put your question in chat, we can go that route. I, I know Teddy. No. Now, okay. Hey, there they are. Hi, Emily, Teddy. Oh, is it better now? Okay, yeah. thanks, Warren. The talk has been fascinating. Um, so I'll keep my question brief because there's a few more. So my question might be a bit more uh, political than economic, but I think it's it's uh, pretty practical. And basically, you know, if we think about historically, the government has not been, you know, the paragon of fiscal responsibility. It's like I feel like every week you read about. Um, another scandal, government contracts going to like, you know, cronies spending millions of dollars on like refrigerators or things like that. So MMT gives us this license to say that the government can spend uh, whatever it needs to give us the things that we need. So how do we stop that from basically turning into the government can now use all these real resources and then squander them away to greed and corruption? It's a, it's a work in progress for sure. And, uh, you know, I've got ideas on like how to take the uh, money out of politics, which is where I think it all starts. You probably heard it, but it's my 60-40 proposal where you can donate any amount of money you want, but 40% goes to the opposition. And, and I think something like, and it doesn't have to be 60-40. I think something like that, you know, goes a long way to neutralizing the effect of money in politics. And it doesn't cost anything from government and it's easily enforceable. And there are questions like, well, what if you have three parties or four parties? But the states already have these situations. They've already figured it out. Whatever you do is much better than what we have today, where the one candidate gets the entire donation. And uh, you've probably seen a list of my proposals on my website. But, uh, you know, yeah. Look, we have, um, we don't have enough bank regulators to handle the, uh, you know, the banks that we have. And what's the answer? We've had presidents who have cut down on bank regulators. I'm sure that was due to bank lobbying so that they aren't watched as closely, right? So and I, in terms of banking, I've always said, look, the first thing you do is you put the regulation in place, make sure you can regulate it. And then you slowly open the spigot to let them do it to make sure that you can properly control it because they're dangerous animals. And now we've got this move for public banking as if that's some kind of panacea. Now I, I understand all the problems with private banking, but public banking has its own massive set of problems and everything gets politicized. You know, you don't get a loan, a home mortgage loan unless you have a Trump sign in your house or something like that. And uh, we saw that happen in all the European public banks for years. I remember uh, Paribas and uh, Santander and all those are just riddled with, you know, scandals and insiders things in public banks. And we still have that happening in emerging markets where all the public banks have Massive scandal. Now, I'm not saying it's worse than the private bank. I'm just saying they're both got to be controlled before you turn them on. And so we have all these proposals to do things without getting controls in place first to see how, you know, for, for the process that's going to follow. Same thing with the infrastructure program. Do we have controls in place first that, you know, will control this kind of thing and at the same time facilitate immediate you know, deployment of the, of the funds and the resources. I, I don't think we do. You know, it, it seems to be, uh, you know, the politics come first as to, you know, this is what we pass for you or whatever. And they want to get that out there, have the headlines, check the ratings and whatnot. And then, then the rest, maybe it happens and maybe it doesn't. Okay. Alex, you had a question? Yeah, I yeah, uh, so, so I was listening to uh, one of your interviews the other day, and you, you were um, critical of the Obama administration for having a lot of um, exporters on uh, advising. And it was a line yes, that stuck with yes. me. He said they shouldn't even have a seat at the table. And it's because yes. their interests are directly opposed to national interest. And I yes. suppose this is because their, their interest is pushed down the price of production and um, and exports are a real cost. So why would you want yeah. more of a real cost in a sense? Yeah, they're, 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 yeah, their buyers are non-residents. 
Right. Yeah, um, and then you, and then the other day you you were um, critical of the the announcement of um, talks for S SDRs um, in in poorer yeah. countries, yeah. and you said it's a, a gift to the exporters, and I imagine that's because if you're if you're giving them currency, they're going to buy U.S. exports, and and I never really made that connection before, because um, uh, previously when I'd heard of SDRs, it was it was in Europe for the financial crisis. Um, yeah. So I was wondering one. Um, what, what do you think are the appropriate uses of SDRs? And, and two, are, are there any other pernicious gifts to exporters that I, I might I might not be so aware of? Because because yeah. generally exporters are praised when you read the newspaper because they, right. they make jobs. And I, uh, I, right. I've said the you know Marx talked about capitalists, but what I'm saying is the exporters are Marxist capitalists. Who was talking about? Because the domestic right. industry wants to see enough domestic demand to sell their product. The exporter doesn't want any domestic demand, so he can hire cheap labor. He likes to see high unemployment and everything else. So it's counter to the interests of the country. Uh, SDRs were set up to uh, provide exchange uh, reserve, foreign exchange reserves to countries during the period of fixed exchange rates. And that was the whole IMF thing was to facilitate smooth workings of this system they set up. And uh, so we don't have the fixed exchange rate anymore. So the whole idea went by the wayside, and then they look kind of reinvented themselves instead of just going away like they should have, because it's, it was an institution made for a different piece of legislation that's gone. So that, you now we still have this institution. So they somehow got to reinvent themselves as lending to countries that are in trouble in general for whatever reason that is. I guess including Greece, which was complete nonsense to lend Greece euros that they got from the European Central Bank. They could have done that directly. They didn't need the IMF. That was just a political, I don't know, smokescreen or something. But um, the uh, so what they're trying to do here is raise SDRs to provide foreign exchange because the U.S. would buy SDRs with dollars, and those dollars would go to countries that would then have dollar reserves to use to support their own currencies. Well, why do they support their own currencies? Well, that's to allow insiders to sell those currencies, like I was talking about for Venezuela, but they're all doing it to all these uh, uh, emerging markets, countries that have issues with corruption in the banking system. And that's where the dollars come from that go to the insiders selling their local currency. And so they're supporting the currency to let these people out and let them cash in. And then the debt gets socialized, right? By more IMF programs, which are highlighted by what we call austerity creating high unemployment to somehow increase your wealth. This makes no sense, right? <laughs> anyway, so I, I just like categorically against right now, you know, funding these IMF initiatives that are, are suspect, you know, on the surface. And the more you dig into them, the more suspect they get. All right, we're gonna wrap it up, uh, Mr. Mosley. I appreciate all the time and effort you've given to this presentation, a lot of yeah. food for thought kind of want you to leave us with some words of inspiration on how we could move forward in this MMT world. What advice would you give the activists that are among you here? Okay, so the good news is we are moving forward. You wouldn't have been here five years ago asking me anything. So somehow we've gotten from there to here. Uh, you know, it's taken, you know, it used to be just me and then there were two or three of us and then it was four and then eight, and then 16. And it's been growing geometrically that way pretty much by word of mouth. And it's it's been a grassroots movement to understand that the sequence is backwards, hopefully to understand the interest rate policy backwards, but, and, but largely on this sequence backwards. Now, there've been a lot of grassroots movements in the history of the world for labor, for women's rights, for all kinds of things. I, I don't think there's ever been one that's built continuously for 30 years to, to correct the sequence of understanding and central bank accounting and operations. But here it is, and here you all are, you know, uh, promoting this. And, it's, and so I think right now it's an unstoppable force, but uh, it just requires an enormous effort. And I think once you understand it, it's so outrageous that, and you'd never go backwards. Once you understand the government's not going to run out of money, you don't change your mind three years later and say, you know what, change my mind and think it will. So I, I think you're all self-motivated enormously self-motivated and there are now millions of you and I think there's no stopping you. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. It's, it's taken on a life of its own. 
there's all kinds of offshoots coming up with things like sovereign currencies and whatnot. None of it's bad or anything, but it's all, you know, taken on a life of its own. And it's going in a lot of different directions. We've got a whole group going in the legal direction. They've done a lot of good work and, uh, you know, totally uh, independently. And, and so, uh, and the academics have taken it to where the mainstream now has adopted it. A lot of them are saying, yeah, we knew this all the time. And then you see quotes of them saying the U.S. is going to turn into Greece if we don't do something about the debt 10 years ago. But, you know, whatever. It's you're part of an unstoppable wave coming on and it's not going backwards. And it's just uh, whether it's going to happen tomorrow or six months from now or a year or two from now. But it's been growing geometrically, and uh, which means it's um, it's past the tipping point. And it's taking over. And. I'm thankful to all of you. I'm thankful for you to be on this presentation and uh, look forward to seeing what you all do next. Thank you. Yeah. All righty. Thank you, Warren, and thank you, Robert. This was great. I'm looking, okay. forward, to, I'm looking forward to more of these. I hope we need to get yes. this, keep getting this word out to people. Yes, very good. So important. So important. Absolutely. Thank you, so All right. Thank you Susan. Good All night. right, guys. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Very interesting.